looking at citizen science and contributing to research. Um, so I've asked to keep this quite focused, so it's going to be a bit quick. Uh, the first thing was, um, we didn't know what citizen science was, um, and we didn't like the term um, citizen science. Um, we didn't like it, and we thought, well, we've been doing it for years anyway, and it's just been given a new name, surely. Um, but we kind of talked around it, and we thought, um, can we harness it? Well, yes, we can, but it comes back to that old, the old essence of recognition and sustainability. Um, so making sure that projects have a long-term um, sort of support from professionals, etc. Um, the second question we were looking at, could we all develop similar digital platforms like Micropass in Britain from above? Um, we said, yeah, we can, but should we? Um, and is it creating um, barriers in and of itself? So those people um, who don't engage with um, technology, don't want to, aren't able, um, for whatever reasons, we're creating a barrier to them being able to engage in these projects um, by creating digital platforms and pretty much just getting on the bandwagon. So anything that we do has to come with other complementary um, parts to the project, whether that's exhibitions, face-to-face, um, -face, you know, it always works. Um, so that's kind of, we talked around a lot around that. Um, and leading on to it, the negatives to citizen science. Um, our worry was that there's a blurring um, in the relationships between projects and local authorities. So we need some clarification of roles so that communities know who to go to if they want to report something like vandalism or something like that is that they, the local authorities are just as visible as the projects, so we need to make sure we keep those roles clarified. Not necessarily separate, but we need to clarify them and really establish them. Um, leading on from that, how can we encourage more active engagement in research frameworks? And we decided that actually telling people about them would probably work, <laughs> <laughs> to start with. Um, and also, hang on a second. Um, and also using them to give communities a bit of a, a focus. So if we actually have research frameworks that have been developed properly, um, we can establish those research gaps and we can help steer community groups towards actually addressing those research gaps for us. Um, and maybe helping guide um, you know, HLF decisions, for example. If we highlight those research gaps, we can say to the HLF, look, you know, We've got all these questions answered. What if you get projects to do with these? Can you just, you know, maybe focus a bit more around those? Um, and having research frameworks that are applicable to local projects as well. Um, so leading on from that, uh, it was about the HCR. Um, they're, you know, groups produce big data sets, but where is it going? Um, and are HCRs ready or resourced to receive those? Um, and we thought national projects. Um, need to develop a relationship with HERs. Um, so don't just go off on your merry way without engaging with um, all the HERs as well, because there has to be a two-way process. Information has to come from those national projects to feed into the HER, and that's the same for any projects at all, local or national or regional. Um, We've still got a low understanding of what HERs are, and we said, oh, well, maybe we should have this massive launch of what HER is. Um, so we need to, you know, be aware of that. And again, is it, are they resourced? We come back again to the old chestnut of capacity. Capacity and time and engagement, because some aren't willing to engage um, for those reasons. So, that was it. That's brilliant. That's quite contentious. I like it. <laughs> First, whose role is it to curate community groups who often work outside of the planning system? Well, first of all, we decided, or I decided, that I don't like the use of the term curate in that context. Um, liaise, maybe? I like that more. Um, we're not all museum curators, and I know museum people get very annoyed about us using the term. Don't. Um, whose role is it to liaise? Um, has traditionally been county archaeologists. All agree that local authorities are under increasing pressure, very difficult, um, especially when any remaining outreach staff aren't core funded. Um, perhaps CBA regional groups? Um, who else is there? I'll leave it at that. Um, 
We're now talking about schemes like Adopt a Monument, Citizen, Scotland's Urban Past. How can we support groups to complete work to a professional standard? Um, continuity of relationships came up, especially from our volunteers here. Um, long term sustainability. There is a problem with loss of support at the end of projects. Um, even within those organised schemes, it is even more acute when it's very short term projects hopping one from time. Um, <coughs> so, how do you get around that? Um, I'm not sure. Again, um, we're not sure. Possibly more of a role for the CBA regional groups. Uh, leading on to the next question, what is the funder's role or responsibility with this process? Um, now, that's an important one. I mean, talking about it in the context of HLF, we all agree that there are problems with HLF project designs that might not have enough archaeological input and not enough concern from the HLF about what happens to the dissemination of those projects. I know that's something they are considering and they are thinking about, so hopefully that will change. Um, possibly, if the HLF could set aside a pot of money to help with project setup costs, project designs, and make parachute payments to support groups after a project has ended, if that got the better value for money for their projects, would they be willing to invest a little bit of money in that? I'm not sure, I, I hope so. But the broader problem is that, certainly I'm aware from our survey, the majority of groups are completing projects that are not funded by HLF, that are often funded from their members' own resources. How do you talk about goals and responsibilities when people are funding self-funding, funding their own work out of their own pockets? Difficult. Community archaeology can sometimes be perceived as producing substandard work and results. Does this re reflect the reality of active engagement? Sometimes. Um, in some cases, you get better results. Extra value, um, time, care, attention to detail. Um, sometimes the focus is on the process. Sometimes that may be to the detriment of the archaeology. We all know that there is huge hugely broad church of projects out there um, with all sorts of different standards of work and results. Um, it depends on the nature of your outputs and your priorities. Going on from that to by ensuring groups work within professionally set standards, are we restricting active engagement opportunities? Not necessarily, but it does require a receptive approach. Again, maybe that's something that could be taken up by CBA regional groups if they have the capacity. Um, in some cases, it will put people off, and in some cases, that is no bad thing. <laughs> if people are determined to go ahead with archaeology projects and have no intention whatsoever to follow standards, it is no bad thing if they don't do. <laughs> Finally, can standards act as a deterrent or a barrier to active engagement in archaeology? See above. Um, <laughs> Can standards can deter, they shouldn't deter. Um, and it's all about making people aware of how they can contribute and what they can give back and how why their contribution matters and why it matters that doesn't matter what they submit to the HER, if they get something in there that is usable as a source, a couple of sides of A4 and a damn good sketch plan plan is better than a group's scratching around for 10 years over the publication of Site X and nothing ending up in the HR. So, that's a quick summary of our thoughts. Uh, we liked it, we actually spent most of our time looking at different galaxies. Maybe that was <laughs> <laughs> Right, point one. We quite like, well, we do like the idea of uh, citizen science. We thought there was a great potential for this and linking it with the whole thing about heritage values could be quite interesting. Point two, issue of getting it into the HERs. This is tricky, huge amounts of data, lots of information. We're allowing people to go out and collect all this stuff, but there is also the issue in terms certainly of informing the planning system of um, validation. So the suggestion is having a two-tier system or traffic lines. And the third one, it's actually Ed and my idea, is Google Earth Aerial Survey. 
Citizen Science Project, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>
So if we were looking at the maintaining standards question, and we agreed that this was a complex and nuanced subject to which there may be differing opinions. <laughs> we did agree that everybody is capable of doing bad archaeology, both commercial units and community um, units and, and, and trusts and what have you. Um, and you know, standards don't necessarily need to be a scary thing. And rather than sort of enforcing standards, it's more a question of CIFA, for example, getting more of a message out about what what we would like to see and what people should aspire to, quite possibly. Um, I'm going to be a bit quick. Um, and again, I don't know how you do this now. Uh, I'm also going to mention a particularly large pachyderm that waddled into the room at the end. Um, who's sex stands for academic archaeology as well?